Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Wake Up Missoula. I am your host, Scott Ramph. I'm here to usher you in to the last weekend in February. Yes, it's uh, February is pretty much a distant memory at this point, and I don't know about you, but me personally, last two months have gone by just like that. It's crazy. Just a lot of different things happening for sure. Um, uh, we're going to be wrapping up our MCAT Sports, which we wrapped up this week, and you'll be able to see that uh, posted later today on our MCAT's Facebook and YouTube channel. It was between Hellgate and another team. Uh, I believe it was someone from Helena, and so uh, we'll be posting that later today. Uh, just a couple MCAT things here and there. We, uh, we pretty much filled up our Spring Flicks camp. There might be some room for a couple stragglers, but for the most part, our Spring Flicks camp are completely uh, booked. Um, but then again, uh, we're going to be start advertising our summer camps pretty soon, so look forward to that next Friday in which I'll come up with a whole new promo for you guys to enjoy for the next couple, couple months. All right, so former President Jimmy Carter moved into hospice care and after reaching 98 years of age, had has led a very long life advocating for helping the needy and building homes for Habitat Humanities well into his old age. As a reaction to the Nixon Waterskate scandal uh, left Americans' bitterness towards the government, Jimmy Carter ushered in an era of peace and went so far to install solar panels. However, he was, his presidency wasn't as smooth. Um, this was all around the time of the oil embargo and Munich Olympic Games, with, uh, which saw a hostage situation uh, go horribly wrong at the Olympics. Um, from there, U.S. went back to Ronald Reagan. Jimmy opted to jump into hospice care, and with that, uh, the clock started to run for his inevitable death from being taken off basic uh, health care that sustains life and keeping those to help him stay comfortable towards the end. Hospice is a choice that many Americans take when no longer they want to continue. Uh, death by acceptance, kind of like the native chiefs of the past who would leave their tribe and go out into the nature to die. Um, this is a rare opportunity to be part of his living wake in which he'll be able to say his final goodbyes to those he's touched during his lifetime. Uh, Moving on, Russian President Vladimir Putin has walked away from any nuclear arrangement with NATO countries and the Western allies. Um, like the Iran nuclear deal collapsing uh, left and right, the surprise visit to Ukraine by President Joe Biden prompted a response by Kremlin that had denounced the U.S. and their allies as they take another step closer to nuclear war. Mutual assured destruction is a common phrase that both, both U.S. and Russians former USSR on the negotiation table to work things out. Thus far, the U.S. has not only funded the war in Ukraine, but made it harder and harder for, to be Russian in this day and age. In Vladimir Putin's long delayed State of the Nation address, Putin cast his country and Ukraine as victims of Western double dealings and said it was Russia, not Ukraine, fighting for its very existence. Uh, the U.S. U.S. Secretary of uh, State and Anthony Blinken have played this down and said that We'll be watching carefully to see what Russia actually does, end quote. This is uh, all at the heels of Ukraine's one-year anniversary since the war, uh, the war began, and many of the strategies Russians are doing is destroying many key infrastructure places in Ukraine. Because at this point, the U.S. has funded the war against Russia, and as many folks on the Republican side are mounting opposition to support any more spending, the U.S. may attempt moving forward in this conflict. Uh, another country Western allies are looking for is uh, China and putting pressure on them to not arm Russia or aid them in any way during this conflict. Recently, the balloon fiasco f finally fizzled out and China and America are on speaking terms with China downplaying the balloon incident and U.S. taking extreme measures to bring it to Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau into the balloon popping adventures. Uh, accusations between Washington and Beijing over spying uh, using surveillance balloons have added to tensions that are already simmering over the speed of China Sea and Taiwan. Um, just kind of like speaking uh, off the cuff as well as like, hey, it's TikTok. You know, why do they need balloons when they have TikTok? Just, just throwing it out there. But the uh, World Meteorologist Organization said in a report Friday that around 1,000 weather balloons were released every day from 900 locations worldwide to provide crucial real-time data. Montana Senator John Tester, who has been vocal on the balloon issue, of late is running for a fourth term as we're bridging into another topic and you know I'm going to talk a little bit about John Tester some of his history this would be his fourth turn and uh, for Senate it's, uh, it's every six years so it's a big chunk of uh, folks that are in uh, the Senate and o after owner overtaking uh, Conrad Burns in 2006 pretty much my very first election at that time when I was turning 18 the same year John Engen took office in Missoula mind you um, 
This will be uh, up for a fourth term uh, representing the lone Democratic voice in Montana. The last couple of years, he's uh, held strong, and recently, with the growth in Republicans moving to Montana, his seat is uh, now considered a toss-up. Uh, one of his strongest uh, positions was supporting veterans, working with GOP in drafting the PACT Act, which uh, went into providing Medicare for veterans exposure to toxic burn pit and expansion for services to veterans. Although uh, he blindly supports the war in Ukraine, uh, like many other uh, folks in the Democratic Party, I'm anti-war, and I am not happy this proxy war with Russia is costing billions of dollars of our tax money. Just put it out there. I'm sorry. I, I, I just don't want to fight, period. Uh, opinion to decide this upcoming election could be interesting as Ryan Zinke might have his eye on the Senate seat after beating Monica Trunell in the 2022 House state election. Um, oh, you know, speaking more on Tester, you know, it uh, looks like he also was in another article in terms of the University of Montana is looking to expand their tech sector and using the CHIPS Act as part of the many bills passed under Biden to bolster creation and production through the United States rather than outsourcing our semiconductors through Taiwan, China, and other various locations as well. Uh, tensions are high between the U.S. and China. The CHIPS Act was a, a reaction to the halts in production and Elon Musk going so far as the courting China to help sell his Tesla. But I'm definitely getting off topic on this point. But the Missouri current, current articles go into detail with uh, Tester uh, joining uh, Senator Jerry Morin, a uh, Republican from Kansas, to include language that requires one of the new uh, tech hubs to be established in rural states, and Montana is already ahead of the game in vying for that role. The program's details lie at $11.2 billion earmarked for research and development in next generation technologies, which include the $800 million for renewable energy, $1 billion for advancing manufacturing, $1 billion to modernize the electrical grid, and $600 million for research on energy storage. That's the battery, folks. That's the EV batteries. And of course, I talked about this in an NPR article a couple months ago in which we had a formula that we sold the patent uh, after we used taxpayers' money to basically fund the research for this project. We had a great battery and a great storage system, but then we ended up getting rid of the patent somehow, and now it's in the Netherlands, and China has control over the patent. It's, it's, it's a really interesting mess. I want to see about how uh, the U.S. is going forward on protecting these rights to these kind of new uh, products that's getting funded through our taxpayers' money. So UM last year received R1 status, the highest distinction given, and it has made a name in a number of areas ranging from biomedical science, artificial intelligence, and natural resources, among others. University of Montana President Seth Bodner said that, uh, quote, this is about creating jobs at all skill levels. It's not about leading edge technology. It's about creating jobs and sustainable economic growth for Americans and Montana workers not only for today, but as for my kids and grandkids, end quote. So more news on the Brooks Street redevelopment. So there's a lot of stuff moving forward. The Rays Grant, the city of Missoula, Mountain Line have invested $80,000 towards a $847,000 federal grant that will solely look at the upcoming plans to and designs for what Brooks should look like for transit and bike and pedestrian opportunities in a section of town that once was considered the outskirts of Missoula to the fairgrounds. Midtown master plan is a term you will be uh, hearing about among many folks in many neighborhoods in and around the Southgate Mall, fairgrounds, and very long stretches of Brooks uh, Highway 93. If I were to simplify, it would be uh, solo lanes for buses at the center for ad and additional space for bikes and pedestrians to walk freely. Um, but there's going a little bit more detail into this because this is a comprehensive plan uh, that they're going to be investing $23 million dollars uh, which is up for grabs from the uh, the Rays grant, which is considered uh, the new you know Build Back Better, rebuilding America's infrastructure with sustainability and equity. These are the kinds of things Missoula has been very good at with finding federal programs to fix many needs of the community. Which for some, even eighty six thousand dollars of residents' investments on a sidewalk uh, is considered pretty tight for many folks who are uh, who are barely trying to afford to live in the city of Missoula as well. So that's one of the things is that just because it seems small comparatively to how much money we get, there's still some people feeling the pressure in terms of dealing with that. But I'm going to actually talk a little bit more about the tax code for the state of Montana through my city council report. Uh, this is actually a little bit of a different city council report because we didn't actually have the official city council and committee meetings this week, but we did have Wednesdays with the mayor, which is a program that we produce here. And I'll talk about that and you can stay tuned and we'll get there. But in the meantime, enjoy some of those Saturday drop-in kids um, videos have made for your viewing pleasure right now.
Hello humans, are you looking for a creative outlet for your children? Kids get to let their imaginations run wild in stop animation, live action, or blend them together. All sorts of wonderful things. Sign up online or call for more information. For five days in the middle of spring break, we will have a camp at MCAT. You're not doing anything. You're just pretending to do stuff. Welcome to the world of employment. Hey guys, welcome back. Let's jump right in. Let's get to talking about some movies that are coming out this weekend. It's time for Pre-Critic, where I prejudge a movie based on absolutely nothing. Maybe a trailer, maybe a concept. But here's this concept. Cocaine Bear. Basically, uh, an urban legend from a bear that was found with pounds of cocaine hardened in his stomach, which this bear barely lasted any kind of time whatsoever. So, you know, this is an originally like a 175 pound bear, but let's just make it a little bit bigger and let's make some of the things a little bit more crazy and just make this into a comedy horror film, which, you know, most horror is kind of comedy anyways, when you think about it. Jumping right in, let's go take on this legend that will poke fun at the idea of making animals ingest things that would kill a normal person and just kind of see what happens. Enjoy co cocaine bear from the tall tale of a bear that ate too much cocaine and just died. But rumors of his death were greatly exaggerated and this whole movie is basically a representation. So enjoy an 80s movie about a cocaine Kyle's this bear to have a killing munchies and entertains and makes you laugh before you die in this more embarrassing kind of crazy ways that only a cocaine bear can kill you with. So I'm definitely excited about that one. I like the horror films that kind of lean more on the comedy for sure. I'm not much of a just like pure horror fan who goes boo, uh, boo, mirror. Oh, they're behind you the whole time. Moving on. All right, so we have a ghost, yet another horror film that uh, is taking uh, heat of being more of a comedy, but this is more of like a family comedy. So think of Ghost Dad, but oh, don't think about Bill Cosby. All right, David Harbour, the guy coasting on Stranger Things success, will invite you to join a family moving into a haunted house with a ghost that isn't too good at haunting in a modern world. So what becomes a regular haunting becomes a viral sensation, and then the kid basically starts feeling bad after exploiting this uh, ghost, but their dad is just like, oh, we should keep on exploring the ghost, it's cool. And then they start doing it, and blah, 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 things happen. Oh, follow the story of them wacky kids helping this ghost solve their murder. Perhaps the murderer has the plucky kid's corner and the ghost does the thing that protects the kids. And then they have a, 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 an ending, like that Patrick Swayze movie. What, what was the name of the movie again? <laughs> All right, next couple of movies. Uh, speaking of uh, Passover, Jesus, Re Jesus Revolution. A bunch of hippies love Jesus, but a conservative preacher man hates hippies. They'll say, hmm, I never thought of it that way. And everybody loves Jesus despite his rugged appearance. Moving on, mummies. Let's have a lighthearted take on the ancient Egyptian modern family of mummies as they try to... Uh, as they are living mummies, even in ancient times, stuck in the future to get the magic thing to bring them back uh, while having modern adventures along the way. Very fish out of water, but yeah, it's, 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 it's one of those kind of uh, movies that maybe some celebrities did during the pandemic and be like, oh yeah, you know, I, I need to work and I can't really go anywhere, so I'll just do this. And so yeah, they, they, they had Pauly Shore voice Pinocchio and a third iteration of Pinocchio that came out in 2022, which many people just kind of, oh, they did a Pinocchio? And yeah, that's what happens when you're in the public domain. Finally, we have My Happy Ending. This is my truth, which facts cannot touch in my safe space, and My Happy Ending forces you to think. Indie movies about happiness delve more into depression themes and leaves you on a hopeful yet a square one note. Uh, Andy McDowell is in this movie, and if you're from Western Montana, you probably have a, a story about being like, oh, I saw it at a grocery store one time. Anyways, those are your movies <laughs> that are coming out this weekend. You guys can enjoy that or not, but you kind of you kind of get the gist of it, and some trailers just kind of throw it, uh, throw, throw the whole entire plot into the trailer. So, yep. Anyways, uh, up next, we had a brand new dub and stuff, and then we're going to jump right into uh, my city council report. So here is the, from the 1954 movie, Pushover. Just yep. give it back already. You know what? Fine. I don't need this anyway. Well, yeah. well, hold on, darling. Uh, so, stop it. Oh? You think you can go around and... Uh, what are you going to do about it, old man? Just give it back to her, okay? That's really mean. Yeah. What, you got some kind of savior complex? Oh, jeez. Now you just go. Yeah. Uh, oh, sure. Uh, okay, whatever.
Oh, um, that was awkward as heck. Thanks for saving me or whatever. I gotta get out of here. You know, I've uh, seen you in the building before. You don't say much, and I can see why. Yeah, I'm not much of a wordy word guy. My daddy wasn't much of a wordy word guy, but he had his ways. Well, I'm more of a secret admirer type. My mom always said that my daddy was some kind of private investigator. And when he laid eyes on her, he just couldn't take him off her. And he followed her everywhere. Ugh, but not geez. like in a creepy way. Well, that's what she told me. Well, you know, some guys just want to be 100% sure that they're going for the right gal. I only wish that I inherited my mom's blonde jeans, because I'm a brunette. And that stinks. I guess you can always uh, dye your hair or whatever. Oh, well... I've done that before, and then, you know, they asked me to do my eyebrows, and it looked terrible. So like a Chris Hemsworth in a Thor movie kind of deal. Well, it wasn't all bad. I got my third boyfriend from that hair color. He was really nice, but then he saw my roots when I grew, and then he, like, broke up with me, and then I'm like, what? What the heck? Yeah, couldn't you tell? tell? Well, I'm glad that we had, you know, this conversation, even though it was really short. Perhaps maybe we could do a longer conversation. Yeah, if there was only a taller building. My ex-roommate lives at the Empire State Building. Perhaps maybe we could uh, get on that? Yes, but it's late. I have an affinity for pushing buttons in the elevator. It'll make it go longer. I really look forward to it. Oh, wow, this is going really well. Um, so I'll see ya. <laughs> Hey guys, welcome back. We're going to be talking about some city council, but we're going to talk a little bit different because we didn't do have didn't have any city council meetings. But the city did a Q and A with Missoulians in our sponsor program Wednesdays with this uh, Wednesdays with the mayor and Mayor Jordan Hess really leaned into the state of Montana. And so, without further ado, here is uh, Jordan uh, Mayor Jordan Hess talking about uh, what's kind of wrong with our uh, tax system. I think we need to start talking about as Montanans is that local governments are closest to the people, they're closest to the problem, they're closest to uh, finding the solution. And we need to be allowing local governments to take measures to the voters. I don't think it's this radical left-wing idea to say that a local government should be able to ask the voters if they want to do something. <laughs> that's, that's a pretty basic um, function of how our democracy ought to work. And to be able to go to the voters and say, I mean, this building is a great example of this, this, this building is this beautiful facility. And I think that there are people in the legislature who view paying for this building as, as a burden that, that, that Missoula County and the city of Missoula saddled the, the taxpayers with. Um, and it, it fails to understand that an overwhelming majority of the voters wanted this building. This building is this beautiful asset in our downtown that is just, it's an incredible asset. Um, it's an incredible place for exchange of ideas, for learning, for gathering, for meeting, for uh, just for looking out at, at, um, at Lolo Peak. It's, it's this wonderful facility that our community wanted. And that was the tool we had, was to go to the voters and say, do you want this beautiful building that does all, this, all these great things for our community? And they said yes. All right. So yeah, I mean that's a uh, that was kind of like some of the examples of uh, like how the city has been kind of uh, vocal against how the state is uh, kind of um, curtailing some of the powers and the revenue that would be coming into the local communities across the state. Missoula is no different than any other community. In fact, we pay less in property taxes in Missoula than many other places, like in uh, uh, Billings and. Uh, uh, Bozeman as well. So as you heard, the state has made it difficult for uh, Missoula to come up with additional revenue streams to help bolster our community and have mill levies passed to support local initiatives to continue and expand services needed to, in a growing city. Josh Slotnick, County Commissioner, breaks it down. Uh, service being stretched for millions of people uh, just coming through Missoula during our tourist season. So, uh, you know, we're, we're only able to use the services for the people who live in Missoula, but since we have such a large amount of people coming to Missoula, uh, uh, County Commissioner Josh Slotnick is convinced that uh, some of the services are just not uh, available as uh, all year round, essentially. So here's uh, County Commissioner Josh Slotnick. 120,000 residents, 3.5 million tourists. Average stay for tourists are five days. Five days. There was a time when we were a nice waypoint between 
Glacier in Yellowstone. Missoula was known for that. It was like you'd stay yeah. over and that stay was it once and then you go. Well, all the wonderful things that we know of as, as Missoula are also known by everybody else. <laughs> and the folks who come don't just come to uh, catch a good night's sleep before driving the next day. They come so they can hit our river access sites, our trailheads, our glorious downtown, experience that culture I mentioned, and just be in this place that really feels a lot better than most other places. I know I'm biased, but it's true. When those folks are here, those 3.5 million people, and they're here for five days at a shot, they use the services that Jordan outlined, and they don't pay for them. And this isn't because they're behaving badly. It's just the structure of the situation. What that means is all of us who live under a roof, and I hope everybody who hears this or listens to it is living under a roof, we pay for the cost of providing services to our guests. And it wasn't too big a deal in 1999, but now it's a really big deal, 3.5 million. For the county side, we have more sheriff's deputies on shift at any time than we would if we only had those 120,000. On any given day, in let's say a July day, there could be 160,000 people in the county. We have to have an emergency response system that's set up for 160,000, even though only 120,000 are paying for. And uh, one big thing to also uh, take into account is uh, highway patrol. In some communities, don't even have uh, uh, the ability to have sheriffs. So a lot of smaller communities that just don't have the population to, to uh, bolster that have to rely solely on highway patrol to go into larger stretches of uh, services. Like Eastern Montana is a prime example, especially up in the reservation areas between Glasgow, Roosevelt County. Um, Poplar, Wolf Point, a lot of them depend on the um, highway patrol, uh, you know. Um, uh, Josh Slotnick spoke about the idea floating around that Missoula uh, has a spending problem, and this is his reaction to some of the uh, uh, critiques that uh, Missoula has received in the last couple of years. Sure. And I, and I hear this complaint a lot, too. People say, gosh, you know, how many people are actually using XYZ Park, whatever it is, or how many are this? Uh, I never go to the library. I mean, that is an argument out there. I, sure. I think driven by the frustration over property taxes, no matter where the money actually goes. Yeah, yeah, I know you're right. That that is an that is an argument. It's not one uh, I put a tremendous stock into. Uh, there are a whole bunch of roads in Missoula County that I've not driven on, but I appreciate that other people can drive on them because we share an economy, and for the economy to work, everybody needs to drive on the road they need to drive on. So goods and services and people can move about. It isn't just about me. If it was just about me, we wouldn't have an economy. An economy is how we interact through sales and, and commerce. It's not just me and my road. And somebody can say, I don't like that library. Well, you don't have to go to the library. But the fact is this library brings people here and adds to the quality of life. And people choose to live in Missoula not because they get a job at one of those mills. They're all gone. They choose to come here because this place is so wonderful and this library adds to the wonderfulness, as do some of our parks. Now, for sure, we can reach a limit, and I kind of think we're there in terms of amenities. I kind of think we're amenitied up. Right now, I'd like to see us spend more on equity, more time and energy. How do we bring the folks up on the bottom? I think the, the amenities are taken care of for a while. And we also need to continue to invest in the future, because in the future, we'll have more people. We won't be able to rest on our, our laurels of amenity, amenity generation in 2023. We may need a bigger library then. We may need another park or another place for people to hike. So we have to address issues right now, and we also have to make investments in the future, which may seem a little excessive right now, but hopefully don't if you think out a little bit. Yeah, and uh, one of the big things about Missoula, especially just this last uh, year or so, is that we've had an increase about 4,500 uh, folks moving in and moving into new residency in the city of Missoula and they're already talking about redistricting uh, the wards in the city of Missoula to even out the numbers for each ward and the representative so there's a lot of uh, movement and especially the last couple of years have just been like crazy just like unpredictable kind of things a lot of the uh, uh, you know uh, Saving CARES Act, you know, American Rescue Plan, all that stuff is starting to dry up some more. The state of Montana has a huge surplus of money, and yet people are still kind of feeling the constraint in many communities. And Missoula isn't a, a, a solo act. Many other communities in the state of Montana is something they really wanted to harp on in this particular meeting about how, you know, one of the things I harped on as well is that uh, the fact our legislature 
legislature only meets every two years to address Montana laws and bills that need to be cut, bolsters eliminated entirely. Local levels have the pulse of each community and their needs. Heck, even Missoula plowing services are not as fast as some folks in the neighborhood will like them to be. And there are even uh, levels of priority in associated with those, like different sections have different priorities. Like, oh, we're priority one with the, why aren't they here yet? And, and even those are being stretched. Um, and as our community grows, the question of more people means a bigger tax pool to dip into. And Jordan talks uh, more about the challenges with immediate revenue versus potential delays for uh, the new homeowners. So just because we have a bigger tax base growing doesn't mean that we're going to get that uh, guaranteed money for the city of Missoula right away. So here is Jordan Hess. We will be constrained in our ability to provide police and fire services. We will be constrained in our ability to maintain roads. We will be constrained in our ability to do all of these basic you know, bread and butter services if this system doesn't change. Um, and so um, innovating is, um, is um, uh, it's, can be expensive, it can be, I mean, it can save money, but, but you know, innovative, innovative solutions are going to cost money. And um, Pat Williams once said something to me that it's always stuck with me that was, uh, that um, efficiency is a word that people who don't like government use to, to make it smaller. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're, we're pretty damn efficient. I mean, we, uh, we, do, uh, we provide an incredible value and an incredible level of service, uh, and we do it in a really efficient, lean manner. And uh, I think that that's, um, that's something that we need to be talking more and more about, is the level of service that we provide um, for, the, for the dollar input. All right, so let me refer to, refer to my notes again. Da, da, da. Services are only become available as more money comes in. It seems like once or twice a year, new police officers would be sworn in as, uh, as official city services and fire crews have been working with Partnership Health for the Mobile Crisis Unit for folks dealing with mental emergencies, helping to alleviate some of the police uh, calls, and in which the you know state cut mental health services funding in 2017. Gwen Jones, city council president, talks about the similarities to California in terms of capping property taxes uh, that help uh, the poor property taxpayers. Um, so this is uh, what she had to say um, about how uh, other communities have tried to put caps on uh, property taxes. Right. And I think there's some, frankly, some federal taxation issues that we need to look at post-pandemic because you look at how many remote workers are here now and guess where they're paying the majority of their income tax to, wherever the headquarters are. And that was pre-pandemic. The world has changed and so I'm just saying, I think tax policy is very complicated. It has huge ramifications. It needs to be very thoughtful. Um, but if we don't address our property taxes, which are on an unsustainable trajectory, I've heard people from Helena say this from the Department of Revenue, we are running the risk of something like a Proposition 13, which happened in California 40 years ago when they were having escalating property values and their property taxes were going up and Proposition 13, which um, was a very blunt tool and capped property taxes, gutted their public school system, gutted the University of California system and their state college, their state university system, um, huge impacts on their infrastructure for decades. You're and still seeing impacts from Prop 13. Uh, all you gotta do is pull back the layers in California, you could see what happened. And there was something similar to that that was broached in Montana 12, 18 months ago, and I sit on the League of Cities and Towns. I sit on the board. That's the, the entity that, um, for all cities and towns in Montana, they can tap into that as a resource for information, for advocacy. Um, there was a huge concerted effort across Montana to shut that down because we don't want a Prop 13 here. So basically, um, I looked a little bit deeper into Prop 13 in terms of how California dealt with this, and they introduced this in 1978. And if you actually look at those years between the 80s and the 90s, there's a lot of crime, just like with cutting the funding for schools. You know, the rich areas uh, maintained uh, more richness because they could afford it, and the poor neighborhoods got even poorer. 
Um, and so it just, the distribution of wealth became even d deeper entrenched while trying to save the people who had money, money, or the people who needed some of that extra um, revenue from the uh, property taxes weren't able to pay for the amenities. And like, there's a lot of different ways that they were looking into uh, adding more revenue and adding more uh, uh, a new uh, ways of being, a being able to get funding for a lot of different things. But, you know, it's, it, it really results in like cut statewide, they pushed the brakes on revenue streams, which resulted in some schools not being funded. There are a lot of things that went sideways, starting with the post-Nixon world with Reaganomics and Clinton outsourcing housing crisis. There's a lot of things that went wrong on the federal level, not just state levels, but most of which was a lesson with the burdens on these institutions were greatly affected those strugglings to make ends meet. Montana has always been poor. You can tell by the fact our legislature only meets uh, once every two years. And just so you know, just to compare it to other states, we are one of four states that only meets biannually, and Wyoming meets every year, and they have the lowest populated state. They, they meet every single year on their legislature, so it's kind of crazy. So we share our uh, biannual uh, legislature with Nevada, North Dakota, and Texas. Texas is definitely one of, the, one of the biggest highly populated states, and they only meet every two years. So that's kind of crazy to, to think about when you think about this kind of stuff. And thus far, studies show that the tax revenue from communities across Montana account for 96% of property taxes that alone for sources of all revenue for your local communities to you know, improve streets, sidewalks, all sorts of different projects that basically keeps uh, cities uh, going in the first place and the lights on too. So Mayor uh, uh, Hess reflects on revenue. Um, this is what he had to say. Yeah, well, you know, the, the, the valuation increase is, is um, part of the equation. So the total property tax um, is, you know, it's essentially value times tax, you know, times mills, which is kind of a tax rate or, or you know, and, and that equals the total amount of tax coming in. Um, and so that other part of the formula can go down if, if values go way up. Um, and so that's, um, you know, there, there's some, uh, some of that is in flux. Um, but I think the bigger issue is the tax shift. So the, the squeeze from, you know, there used to be um, this industry and now that, that there's this void where there used to be this revenue source. And so everything else has to grow to fill the void. And that's, um, that's really where, where the squeeze comes from, is the fact that we just, um, we don't have the diversity. What we need is a diversity of revenue sources. A good example of that, um, Commissioner Slotnick was really, took the lead on, um, on a Missoula County measure that the city, that the city supported um, to add a local option tax to gasoline. Right. Um, that was allowed under state law. It went to the voters in 2020. It passed by the voters, and it went into effect briefly. The legislature took that away in, in 2021. So that was an effort to, to solve this problem. It was an effort to take, um, to diversify our revenue sources. Um, so now we're back to, you know, and it didn't bring in a ton of money, but it, it brought in a million dollars a year or so, or that's what it would have brought in if it had been allowed to go into effect. And so now that's a shift. Million dollars a year is a couple percentage point on the, of a property tax increase. Um, so everything that, Every tool that we get taken away or every tool that we don't have the ability to explore is a direct result in the in, of, a, of an increase in property taxes. Yeah. So, yeah, that's the, uh, the last quote I have for you from this meeting. And, you know, the gas task, even if Missoula got the $1 million, that would one, mean $1 million less for property taxes. And, yes, there's going to be some crossover and people of Missoula will have to pay that gas tax. But with the increase of people and Josh Slotnick, uh, uh, according to him, we have 3.5 million people boost businesses in Missoula every year. They don't pay any extra kind of fee or any kind of thing. This is basically talk for a, a small tourist tax rather than a, a whole statewide sales tax in which uh, that's basically a, de a political death sentence in the state of Montana to even consider a sales tax. So, you know, just, just think about this kind of stuff, but the, the, the way that things are kind of all right now with the tax code and everything like that, not to mention with the nearly $2 billion surplus the state of Montana has, and yet we are still hurting in many communities across the state of Montana. It's, it's very, it's very kind of crazy when you think about it with the, the state of Montana has a large surplus of money, and then the city of Missoula is it, it, it's sustaining what we can, but just basically from what we're hearing is that the city is just as frustrated as the citizens of Missoula who are frustrated with the city with the projects that and we're spending left and right too. Fire, uh, you know, just think about it in terms of like, um, 
you know, you know, in type, types of services and plans and stuff like that. Like one of the big things is that we build all these parks, all these places and stuff like that, but then we still have the same staff to look after a lot of that stuff. And that was one of the things that uh, w what added to the tourist home fees would help is because we would have folks who would turn their private property into a commercial business. And by doing that, essentially that would um, um, cost money for people to regulate because if you're turning your home into a commercial space, you have to make sure it, it falls under, under a code, the city code for kind of commercial, like hotel kind of deal and permitting processes, which the permit process is like $66 a year just to be able to get that kind of Airbnb. But then it got out of control. And now with a, a lot of uh, services being stretched, that's going on our tax bill. And so by increasing the fees and doing that kind of stuff, our tax bill won't have to reflect the uh, amount of services provided for those folks. And that in turn, for tourisms that are coming to use our services, and not to mention, you know, they call 911 for this reason or another, it's an additional, uh, from what uh, Josh Slotnick said, the $3.5 million sprinkled across the year would essentially create our 120,000 uh, people in the county of Missoula to be an average about 160,000 people that are services that are only able to uh, equate to 120,000 people to help additional 40,000 people. And you know, they always have statistics and be like, oh, like one in every 100 uh, 911 calls are something to be related to like domestic violence or anything like that. But like when you start accumulating more and more people, just those kind of calls are unfortunately inevitable so so even think about it in terms of emergency service and like oh just one more person goes out camping oh they start a fire oh oh the fire got out of control boom we got a whole nother forest fire which even in our forest fire and we have the smoky clouds and stuff like that that also affects tourism season so uh, there was a big push for a, a tourist tax for the city of missoula to try to be like hey we get in a lot of tourists here we want to capitalize on all the people coming to missoula maybe taxing on their hotel stay and that income would also add some more revenue and creating more a diverse revenue stream would uh, help decrease property taxes. And that's basically what this whole meeting was about. And you guys should check this out. It's called Wednesdays with the Mayor. Um, it's a really important thing, and they always want plenty of feedback from people at home, people like you, anybody who wants to come to the meeting, or even just watch it on our live stream, which we do every fourth Wednesday of the month live from the fourth floor of the Missoula Public Library. So it's a good opportunity to uh, get your voice and your concerns said. But yeah. Um, I'm going to end it there, and um, let's talk about some of the events that are happening in and around the city of Missoula. Um, so, uh, as we as we transition into Missoula events, uh, many of the many of the places and many of the, of the uh, resources I use to kind of talk about some of the events that are happening in Missoula is through this webpage, MissoulaEvents.net. Hey, what's going on, in Missoula? MissoulaEvents.net. You can find out what's going on. There's a lot of different things. Big Sky Documentary Film Festival is in full swing. It is their last week, and it is 10 days, and it's already pretty much wrapped up for the week. And it will pre pretty much be showing a lot of the very popular movies, the uh, Audience Choice Award, the uh, just various different documentaries that have impacted people in the city of Missoula for the short week in February. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about that at the end of all these other ones, but let's talk about all the other events that are happening um, congruently with this. And Excel Level 2 at the Lifelong Learning Center. Uh, this course will expand your beginning level foundation with an in-depth look at advanced formatting themes, cell styles, uh, customizing paging setup, date and time functions, um, conditional formatting, advanced functions for text and analysis. If you're interested in learning about Excel and putting it on your resume for realsies, you can join the Lifelong Learning Center to do that. It's basically like night school, but very niche, as in like, I want to go do this. Okay, they might have a class just for that. So it is great for night classes, GED, and that kind of stuff. Live Long Learning Center is one of the old schools MCPS rents out just off of, of 3rd Street next to the old uh, Coca-Cola plant, which is now the Sovereign Hope Church. Makerspace walk-in at the Missoula Public Library. This happens from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. 3D print, laser scanner, all sorts of wonderful uh, things that you can get your hands on. Makerspace is a creative space for engineers and great for STEM for kids. Um, as well, food bank meal distribution, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday from 10 a.m. to uh, 7 p.m. It's open doors for anybody of all income levels to get some free nutritious food, uh, cheap nutritious food. Sorry, I, like they do have sliding scales and they do provide foods because uh, human is uh, food is essential, right? Um, 
Wednesday and Friday. It's uh, today it's going to be only open from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. And so it is the, it, I always talk about it all the time. So moving on, uh, Tiny Tales and Storytime every uh, week at the Missoula Public Library. Tiny Tales and Storytime uh, do a lot of uh, singing, um, book reading, and also some, some, uh, and some arts and crafts over inside the art box. It's all on the second floor of the Missoula Public Library, Fridays and Saturdays at 10.30 a.m. Storytime happens both days, Tiny Tales only on Fridays. So yarns and watercolor, uh, noon, they happen every Friday. It's a great way to do some stitching and crocheting. Uh, yarns and watercolor are happening every uh, Friday at noon on the fourth floor of the Missoula Public Library. You can't miss them. Just look for all the people. There's a lot of people that could do the watercolor. It's crazy. There's just a lot. A tw 20th anniversary, a tw 20th annual Big Side Documentary Film Festival. They'll be showing more films throughout the day and have doc shops and pitch meetings and plenty of opportunities to get resources and support for the documentary and citizen journalism for uh, history, basically living history as it's uh, being shown through the medium of filmmaking. And this is going to be hosted at the MCT, Missoula Trade Administrator, across the street. It's also at the Zootown Arts Community Center. It's also being featured at the Wilma. And then most importantly, it's going to be uh, the, a lot of the doc shops will be on the fourth floor of the Missoula Public Library, in which they'll be doing a lot of that stuff for folks to uh, get involved, you know, learn from the directors about creating documentaries, find the right thing. It's mostly about like, imagine you uh, are doing a short piece, like it's like a video essay, but just really expanding upon the ideas and stuff like that. There's always been a lot of good documentaries and I always like to look at some of them, especially the ones on YouTube that are about 20 minutes long because I always like those kind of short documentaries that kind of go over views of histories and different conflicts and different things like that. But I'm getting off topic. Let's jump right in, back into uh, more library events. Lego Club every Friday at 2.30 p.m. This is the library second floor. History for history buffs. Uh, they're talking about Mike Mansfield, one of the most important figures in Montana history. He basically uh, took the reins after Jeanette Rankin, after she uh, basically uh, went against World War II at the time. She was the solo de dissenting voice against war. So um, Mike Mansfield uh, took over for her, be be basically becoming a senior senator uh, for uh, the state of Montana, and he uh, made quite an impact. You know, one of the strongest ties between Montana and Japan are because of him. I believe he knew like Chinese, Japanese, uh, plenty of other languages too, and basically kind of retired from senatorship to become an ambassador to Japan and created uh, long-lasting ties that we reverberate to today. Not to mention a bunch of buildings are named after him. Anyways, so that's going to be happening in Cooper Room. Uh, a and B from 7 to 9 p.m. tonight, and uh, it's going to be uh, Dina M Mansour, the executive director of the Marine and Mike Mansfield Center, will discuss the Chenner's work to honor the Mansfield legacy. Gateway Show uh, the, is a bone dry comedy presents the Gateway Show. Stand up comedians will take place on stage and tell their best jokes. Then they get to uh, an undisclosed, uh, then they go to an undisclosed location to get way baked, oh, only to come back to the stage and attempt to tell more jokes to be completely baked. Okay, cool. That's what's happening tonight. You can find out more information from events.net. Okay. Uh, way down north at the Old Post, they're going to be uh, playing some bluegrass music starting tonight at 8 p.m. Uh, hip Hop is going to be doing laugh tracks, a night of comedy and hip hop. It's going to be at Suite 2. Uh, the Drip is uh, Monks, uh, DJ Hip Hop Music, uh, Russ Nasset and the Revelators is going to be a jam band at Union Club. And then finally, uh, we got some uh, uh, rock, country music, Wild Prairie Smoke at Sunrise Saloon starting tonight at 9 p.m. So uh, moving on into Saturday events, Family Snow Day. Lolo Visitor Passenger is interested in doing some snowshoeing or skiing, but you're not ready to buy your own pair. The experienced Missoula Parks and Recreation staff will be there to answer questions. Snowshoes for all ages will be skis and boots for you to be available for visitors to try. This is at Lolo Pass Visitor Center, and it starts at 10 a.m. tomorrow morning. Saturday Storytelling at uh, Traveler's Rest State Park. This is uh, spoken word by artist uh, Tom uh, Shinarts. Uh, talks about his sculptures, Dividing the Corpse. So, or dividing the course. Sorry. Uh, so that's uh, what's happening uh, tomorrow, and that's usually uh, you can you can zoom in in, but also you can go there live at the Travelers Rest State Park unless they s specify other words. And they'll be going well until uh, I believe uh, I believe this might be their last one that they're doing the Travelers Rest State Park. It's a lecture series. It's been going on every sa every Saturday. M Cat's been filming it, so you can watch it later as uh, they talk about different things. So. 
uh, Grizz Dip Polar Plunge. So it has been cold this week, and then why not get a little bit colder by uh, basically doing a Grizz Polar Plunge, which basically you just go into even colder water. Uh, and this is a plunge for the Special Olympics. Join below Zero Hero as they take a plunge to raise money and awareness for Special uh, Olympics. They'll have a DJ uh, serving a thyme food truck and lots of fun. Uh, take the plunge and come cheer normally sane people as they become below zero heroes. So that's going to be happening at noon at the Missoula Fairgrounds. Just look for a lot of screaming from people getting uh, the chills. All right, so intro to acting. Uh, the Life and Learning Center is, hey, there, hey, if you ever wanted to act or wanted to be a featured extra in Yellowstone, <coughs> you can uh, hone your skills at the Lifelong Learning Center, build confidence or listening skills. Lifelong Learning Center, much, uh, it's, it's a, it has a lot of great classes and it's sign up as you go. It doesn't, you know, it's, it's whatever. So it's, uh, yeah, that's what's going on there. Uh, MCAT Saturday drop-ins, um, we're hopping that from 1 to 3 p.m. It's a great opportunity for kids to have a place to facilitate creativity through uh, Legos, uh, stick bots, various other toys that can bring delight through the power of stop animation, like Rudolph and uh, Guillermo del Toro's Pinocchio. Uh, 12th annual Winter Brew Fest at Karis Park. So uh, it is the time for a bunch of brew fests to be uh, popping up at Karis Park and uh, from 1 to 5 p.m., you know, brew fests with over 40 taps of Montana beers and ciders and seltzers to try. Uh, food trucks, wine, mimosa bar, all sorts of things. Perfect way to enjoy the winter downtown. And it's free to all just to pop in and then you just buy all the uh, food and stuff from the trucks and whatever if you want to. Uh, fire starter workshop with survival kit demo. Backyard tap house. Come learn about the essential tips about Danica and Danny. Always keep their hunting survival kit. You have the opportunity to test some of these store-bought uh, fire starters and even get to make your own fire starters. Attendees will get to take home 12 handmade fire starters each in which uh, with knowledge of wildness, wildlife survival. Registration is required. Event takes place outdoors. So it's going to be cold. Uh, food bank fundraiser. Uh, performance by a child bloom guitar which is a great opportunity for a lot of kids to learn a guitar and just uh, they usually perform and this time they're performing at liquid planet and it starts at 6 p.m on saturday also happening at 6 p.m on saturday is the ymca sweetheart dance children and their adults will dance the night away at the y semi-formal sweetheart dance great music professional pictures uh uh corsages for every kids and more cool um, I guess uh, I remember the Y dances from long ago, but I never remember attending them. I remember my friend would always attend them because apparently he liked to he liked to party when he even when he was in middle school. Um, but anyways, uh, solid snake karaoke in the uh, uh, West Side Lanes uh, bowling alley. Jackson Holt and the Highway Patrol is going to be at Union Club. It's going to be a jam band. Uh, Kahoot is going to be country music at the Sunrise Saloon. And finally, we got some DJ music at, with Chris Moon at the Badlander. So we do have a little bit more time. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, some of the Big Side Documentary Film Festival movies that are going to be playing uh, today, tomorrow, and other ways. Um, so there's the uh, the Nature Connection short pitch is happening. And then there's the Big Sky pitch starting at 1230 noon on the fourth floor at the Missoula Public Library for Doc Shop and special events. Uh, the first movies, is uh, they're going to be in competition short starting at 3 p.m. They're going to be featured at the Wilma. Zach is doing schoolhouse docs at uh, 4 o'clock. Um, you got uh, Short Blocks, uh, number 14. So these are a lot of short documentaries that will be playing, and that's going to be Missoula Community Theater starting at 6 p.m. And those are all your starting points for those, and they'll be wrapping up with uh, Hollywood's Finest at the Wilma Elephant 6 a Recording Company, The Holly. Uh, most of these are documentaries. You can look this up on the uh, Big, Sky doc uh, Big Sky Film Fest org for more information on this. Uh, and then we, as we transitioned in, into um, your Saturday, um, the, the first movies that are going to be playing around noon, um, Missoula Community Theater will be hosting The Smell of Money. Well, we'll be doing the Short Blocks 15, 16, um, starting at 1230. And then, you know, over at the Zach, starting in the afternoon, one driver, one mic. Uh, and then wrapping up for Saturday night uh, at the Wilma Sex with Sue. Uh, this much we know it's going to be at the, uh, the Zach. And then finally wrapping up at the Missoula uh, Children's Community Theater is the uh, Como's uh, Tamaki's Nasoko Before the Sun. So it's going to be an interesting time over at the Big Sky Documentary Film Festival. And then, of course, I might as well talk a little bit about Sunday since I have a little bit of time. Is that they'll around uh, uh, 12 noon, they're going to have short block number 18 and, um, starting at the Wilma. 
uh, kicking the rest of your Sunday. They're going to have award screenings on Sunday night starting at uh, 5 p.m. at the Missoula Community Theater, and this is going to be their award screening one, um, starting at 5 p.m., award screening two at 7.30 p.m., and then they're going to have a bunch of other movies that are happening at the Wilma and the Zach uh, wrapping up with the Cowboy Poets at the Wilma at 6.45 p.m. Water, Dust, Bre uh, Water with Dust Bread will be at 7 p.m. Uh, at the Wilma. Most of these you can look up on the Big Sky Documentary Film Fest, so you can go to bigskyfilmfest.org for everything you need to know. Cowboy Poets look like, you know, they always have a, a couple of uh, documentaries that are just like, okay, you got to see this, and they usually put that at some of the uh, prime hours of the night, and it, there's just a bunch of other events that are happening as well. So, I don't know, there's not much I want to talk about in terms of MCAT-related things. I might want to talk about a couple uh, maybe Sunday events that have nothing to do with uh, the, uh, the Big Side Doc. So... Let's talk a little bit about Sunday before I jump back in, before I wrap up my show. Um, yoga, 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 dancing, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> nah, there's, there's not much. Uh, yeah, short blocks, you know, documentary film festival. Um, yeah. I think I pretty much covered most of the things I needed to cover, honestly. Uh, John Floridus is going to be playing at the DraftWorks Brewing Company on Sunday. You know, he's a great musician in town. Uh, karaoke, country karaoke at the Sunrise Saloon on Sunday as well. Um, yeah, but that's pretty much it. Uh, if you want to learn more, like I said, you can go to MissoulaEvents.net. Just a lot of different uh, events happening in the city of Missoula. All right, so that pretty much does it for me and my morning show. I, I did want to thank you guys for joining me this morning and for Wake Up Missoula. I'm Scott Ramp. Take care.